Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new Redefining Security podcast. Have you ever thought that we are selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Perhaps we are. So let's look at how we can organize a successful InfoSec program that integrates people, process, technology, and culture to drive growth and protect business value. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Archer empowers organizations to manage multiple dimensions of risk on one platform with on-premises and software as a service offerings and quickly implement industry standard processes and best practices for advanced risk management maturity, informed decision making, and enhanced business performance. Learn more at archerirm.com. Here we are. We're on a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. This is Sean Martin, and you're very welcome to uh, today's conversation. It's a, it's a moment in time where things are a bit angsty, and I, I feel we'll probably touch on that quickly uh, during this conversation, uh, but the reality is there can be many moments like this. Um, and there will be, I'm sure. And my my objective with today's conversation is to kind of help people to take a step back, perhaps take a deep breath, think about what's going on in their organization, think about what matters, and leverage the community uh, to to apply some best practices uh, that uh, that could help deal with a crisis the that could be looming, could be pending, and and. The topic or the working title of this conversation is the playbook to defend against an aggressive adversary, where it's not just the something could happen someday, but we're actually seeing a lot of signs, a lot of signals that that crap's up, crap's going on, and it's flying everywhere, and, and people, are, companies are going to get tagged or get caught up in the crossfire uh, from a cyber perspective. So um, this conversation is driven as. Many of many of my topics are in, in redefining cybersecurity by a post that I saw, and uh, it was one from Mick Douglas on Twitter that uh, I just happened to see get some props uh, in other places on Twitter and even on LinkedIn um, as being a, a great post. So uh, my suspicion was correct in that this is a, a good topic with a lot of great points, and I'm thrilled to have Mick on the show. Thanks, Mick, for uh, for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out. Yes, it's going to be good. So the and of course, I'll link to link to this post in the show notes. Uh, but before we get into it, I I want to hear from you who you are and what you do that led you to this to this post that says I've had three calls already today. This is a few days ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, three calls already today, and it's not even ten in the morning talking about uh, aggressive cyber ops from a particular particular nation <laughs> country, right. uh, that's that's made an invasion since then uh, what, what do you do uh, what's your role in the communities you seem to have a lot of respect from a, lo- a number of folks who is Mick and what was the catalyst for uh, putting this tweet together sure well, I'm, I wear quite a few hats in addition to the baseball hat that I'm actually wearing. I, um, so a couple things about me. I'm an instructor for SANS. I'm also a member of the EINS research uh, faculty. And so those calls were actually a part of a thing that they do called Ask an Expert series. And the way EINS works is they have these um people on faculty who are practitioners at a very, very high level. And you go through this vetting process to get in and um, I was accepted. And so periodically I have these calls where people need strategic guidance. And um, so 
I was on these calls and they were all the same. It was basically, hey, we're worried about nation state attackers. Are we a target? And what was interesting is, at least from my perspective, is they might not be a target of like, you know, they might not be an actual objective, but they might be a jumping off point or they might be a collateral damage. And so I was helping them understand what their risk profile might actually be. And then I was giving them some very tactical advice on how to rapidly improve their security posture against very advanced adversaries. And so it's a very different playbook from what you're used to in day-to-day -day type IT and IT security operations. Yeah, and let's, let's quickly talk about that uh, before mm -hmm. we get into some of the points you make, because uh, InfoSec Twitter is a, is a fun place, and I'll use air quotes, fun place, uh, for those, those listening here. Um, there's always the ambulance chasers. There's always the, mm -hmm. we, we know better than anybody. Um, here's our advice. And, and I've seen some posts saying that you can't, not, not this word specifically, but you can't take years of strategy and planning and budgeting and staffing and, and actually buying technology through procurement and ask an, an organization to cram that all into a week to all of a sudden prepare for an aggressive right. adversary. And so I think that for me, that's where the rubber really meets the road in, in that how do we take something quick and meaningful and see it through to implementation such that we can actually put some shields up yeah. within our organization to, to handle this. So uh, any thoughts on that? And then, and then maybe dive into some of the points you've made. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So first of all, <laughs> I, I'm going to throw some shade. I think that there's a lot of uh, people who have what I will, um, with a good bit of disdain, call ivory tower uh, practitioner status. They have not worked at large organizations. They haven't worked at small organizations. And so when something happens, they pull down, you know, the CISSP book or, you know, whatever book they have on hand. And they're like, well, page one says we do this. And the next chapter is this. And then now because the time is, you know, of the matter, like, let's go, 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 go. And that, that's just stupid. I, it, it really is. And that's like one of the things that, caused me that and the frustration of having three calls back to back that we're all the same at by 10 a.m it, it kind of caused me to send that thing uh that, that tweet out with a little bit of rage and ire in that because um i i don't know like what you have to do is in in these sorts of situations you have to sit back and say okay couple things. Number one, our adversaries, if they're skilled, like we think they are, they've got our playbooks. You know, we've been for 20 years telling people, patch, deploy the firewalls, you know, um, do this, do that, right? They have that playbook. They also have labs. So they, they know how to bypass these defenses. So what you really need to do in these situations is take the malware, take the tooling that these groups have, and deconstruct it. And so if you look at that list of recommendations that I gave, it kind of flips a lot of security conversations on its ear. You know, most organizations can't do a good job of patching, of um, not patching, but uh, dealing with their firewall. And so what they will do is they will sort of kind of do okay on inbound, but egress is where things really go sideways and they tend to be much, much more permissive outbound. Now for years and years, I've been a pen tester and I've been you know, blessed to have some amazing clients and do amazing work in this field and work at some great pen test orgs. So I understand deeply how important it is for an attacker to get outbound access. A very common thing is a reverse shell, and that's where the attacker sits back and listens for the victim machine to phone back in. If you successfully break that phone home, the attack still happened. It's not ideal, but the damage has been greatly curtailed. And so I wanted people to focus on that because 
Yes, it's hard to do egress filtering, but it has an um, outsized payoff. So if you do a good job of egress filtering, you will really sweep the leg on a lot of attackers, especially the more advanced ones. So too with application whitelisting. It's hard to do application whitelisting slash application control. And so application control is really effective. I mean, there are bypasses for it, but it's hard. And so it, it, you want to do things that really make the attackers have to refigure how they're going to go after you. And application control is amazing. And uh, one of the things that I tried to do in that tweet was give people tips on how to actually do the thing. So I shared with them how to use the system resource usage monitor database from SRUM. And that's part of Windows. It's been part of Windows since Windows 8. It tracks the last 30 days of all the applications that you've been running. And so you can take that, it uh, outs puts it into a CSV file. What you would just do is unique the, um, like remove the duplicates on those applications. And now you have a list of every single app every single executable that that machine has run in the last 30 days. And you can use that for your app locker or whatever application control system you're going to be using. And yeah, I love that you have, you have tips and, and actually some tools as well. Um, trying to think where, where to go next. Cause I guess the, the immediate question I have is, are organizations not doing some of these things already uh, or they do and, and just aren't paying attention to it? Where, where's kind of the disconnect between every day and uh, aggression mode? That's a great question. And it's hard to, to say, you know, different or it, it's a continuum, you know, different orgs are doing this stuff as part of the basics. And what's interesting is it's not, um, you can't attribute it to like organization size because I know some fortune single digit orgs that are not doing this stuff, or at least not to the degree that they probably should. But I, I know um, small shops that are doing this very well. I know large shops that are doing this very well. It's, do you have a culture of caring about this sort of thing? And I think part of the problem this is a really good question. It's one I've been kind of struggling with the last few days since I sent that tweet. I think part of the problem is that security, like what you and I think of as cybersecurity, is um, it's hard to make a business justification for. Um, at best, it's revenue protection. That's at best. Most organizations see it as just a cost center. And so it's little wonder that many orgs aren't doing all the things that they should be doing because if they see it as just, you know, money down the drain, they're going to do as little as they can feel is appropriate for them. Yeah. I guess it's a, it's always a balance balance act of which things should we do and, and mm -hmm. which resources do we, do we well, and uh, secure and apply? Right. I'm, I want to be clear, you know, if yeah. I'm a small business owner, if you like right, one of the things I forgot to mention and my marketing team will punch me in the face if I don't mention it now, I run a, a small consultancy group called InfoSec Innovations and we do boutique security type stuff. We do pretty good. Like we try to do all the things because we have to eat the dog food. But if you came to me and said, hey, Mick, would you rather do this like real arcane firewall thing or would you rather work with a billable client? I want to shake that money tree, right? Like I want that money. And so it makes sense that an org with their limited time, limited attention will go after the stuff that makes money, not spends it. So there, there's a, um... See, I'm just going through the list here. Num mm -hmm. Number 11 is about land attacks. Yeah. And uh, that's not something I'm very familiar with, and I don't know how wide, widely understood that is. Maybe can you, can you tell us a little about what land attacks are and, and the, the context of that tweet and maybe some, some thoughts for folks listening on that? So, like, just what are living off the land attacks and how they work? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. So 
attackers have learned how so let's back up okay years ago it used to be pretty easy to do attacks you would create and exploit a bit of malware and you would deliver it to a system and you would make that malware run that's become increasingly difficult a lot of defensive tools have gotten much 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 better over the last two decades and so as a result attackers have realized that when they are creating malware there's a high degree of probability that it's gonna fail or it's gonna be caught in some way so what's more advantageous is if you can take existing executables or tools that are on a machine and use it against that machine I'm not really proud of this um, but when i was growing up i used to torment my younger brother andy andy if you're listening to this recording i'm still sorry about this but one of my power moves as the big brother that was being the jerk is i would grab my little brother by the wrists and i'd have him smack his face and i'd be like stop hitting yourself stop hitting yourself and that's exactly what a living off the land attack is you're using the system against itself or against its peers on the network and the reason that's so advantageous is antivirus and other detection and prevention tools aren't going to stop it because it's part of the os the ports and protocols are likely to be allowed in fact in many cases a lot of security tools have exception lists to allow these tools to run because they need to and so how maybe maybe leading from from the tweets here how, how do organizations get a handle on that because mm -hmm. that, that well, to me seems like the, the the pairing with the they're in they're they're taking stuff out but then now they're in and they're using it against you using yeah against no you it, it it it's very very tough and one of the things that i, I want to be clear about is i love doing penetration testing i love doing offense but I love defense because it's so much harder. And um, this, what you've just asked, is like the key difficult issue that we're facing. So that's where, again, things like the SRUM analysis, looking at the last apps that have been used in the last 30 days, you can detect if somebody's using an unexpected executable. That's something that you could investigate. Um, you know, if you really want to go extreme, like t take the um, this analysis to its furthest conclusion, I have some of my clients, and these are clients of fairly small to all the way to fairly large, um, where they've actually made Microsoft an untrusted publisher in their app locker profile. So that means when I'm doing a pen test against them, if I deliver, successfully deliver a macro that's got malicious content, when the macro runs, it's not going to run in, in the way that I think it would because certain tools like cmd.exe or powershell.exe have been disallowed. And I can only use the executables that that user has used in the last 30 days, which makes for an incredibly barren experience as a, as an attacker yeah there's there's so many points in here i want to get to but hmm? i want to i want to raise this question the difference between uh a breach gaining access gaining a foothold egressing controlling um versus just flat out taking shit offline <laughs> okay um is there a difference between those two and then i don't know i don't know if there's anything uh, i know you're shaking your head yes uh, yeah. but in, in the context of an aggressive uh, adversary versus normal day and, and anything in, in your tweet thread specific to that that you want to highlight well i didn't cover that um so Normally, like what you're saying is, normally you have some form of command and control or C2 that takes place between a victim machine and the attacker. Sometimes the attackers don't need or want that, that interaction. Instead, they will deploy things like wipers or other system destroy utilities that will either like 
low level format the drive or, or do things that make it unusable. And that that is where things like application control can be very, very helpful because if those tools get in, the egress, the firewall outbound rules that I was talking about earlier in the Twitter thread, they're not going to help because once that tool is successfully deployed to that victim network, it could in theory start running amok without needing to make any outbound connections. And at that point, application control is your best bet. Another thing that you could do that I didn't cover in the in the Twitter thread, if you're very worried about those concerns, you could do a thing called network micro segmentation. And there's a variety of ways that you can accomplish it. Probably the most trendy way is through a technique called um, zero trust networking. Um, but there are other ways of achieving that depending on your organization though, it's typically kind of difficult to have an effective micro segmentation uh, policy. So I didn't get into that level of nuance in the uh, Twitter thread. And that's something that uh, building up a repository of some, some things that organizations can and should do uh, as a follow-up to that uh, thread. And um, that is something that I do talk about or, or have in the draft that I'm getting ready to release. Nice. Yeah. Cause I, I know one of the, one of the top uh, tips is to segment, right. Kind of yeah. isolate the, the it's piece, tough, the core though. stuff, right? It is tough. It is tough. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I had a conversation with a health core organization where they, they actually accomplished it and achieved it. And, and, that, and even just them describing how they did it was difficult for them to kind of lay out and, and for yep. me to even understand <laughs> some of it. But, I, I actually can give you the way that I do this when I uh, okay. do it with my clients. I will publish... I, I will in a small group, like, you know, either like I like to always start with the security team because I think it's important that you know how your controls actually impact people. What I like to do is I will turn on host based firewall in a very different config. And so you unless you've done weird things on your Windows machine, Windows Defender firewalls running. But I will make some changes to it and I will log certain types of connections and still allow them, right? And then what I will do is stream those logs using either Windows event forwarding or I'll install a log agent on those machines and then feed it into a SIM or some other log an analysis tool. And then um, what I do is I'll do this for like I, it, at least 60 days, I'm really more comfortable if I let it run for 90 days. And then what I will do is based off of that, I craft a, like, here's how the network's going to be carved up. And whether or not that connection should or should not have been there, I'm just, I'm just allowing it because there's so many connections to deal with. I'm not worried about cleanup and validation. It's just, if you had that connection, you're good, you're allowed. And then we deploy that but not yet in, 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 in enforcement mode, we do it in a monitor mode. So we will still see if these connections are good. And then if they are, then maybe like, and this is usually like two weeks of just validation. Then we flip the firewall rules into enforcement mode. And then what you have to do is any block, when that block alert kicks up, that's one of the highest priority alerts once you've moved to this mode. And the reason why is one of two things. One, you've got a broken business process and you want to be alerted on that right now so that you can give excellent customer care. Or you just caught an adversary in the very early stages of breaking out of that machine that they've taken over. So it's a really cool way of getting like super, super powerful information and the other thing that's awesome is it's like there's zero false positives on that and then um, my record so far is good after i've done that approach that slower approach um, like a lot of times the clients don't the the end users at those clients they don't even know that the network has changed i have no idea it, like daily daily business just is normal for them nice 
Nice. So you said 60 days there, and first thing that comes to my mind is, do we have 60 days? <laughs> yeah, and that's what that's <laughs> plus, one of the reasons. Two weeks. I, yeah, that's one of the reasons I did not include it in that yeah. list is because that was just a real quick, like down and dirty, let's get it done yeah. approach. Yeah. Is there a down and dirty equivalent to that? Is it or is it just straight up app? Grab a grab a list using Shrum and and apply and and hope for the well, best. Or for is that too aggressive? For the applications, you can use Shrum. I'm not aware of anything native to Windows that has the network connection logging. Now, if you have deployed um, Sysmon and have the network connection profiling enabled, you would get that. Um, you know, there's some EDR products that track that, and you could use that. But for most organizations, they just don't have that telemetry, unfortunately. Right. right. All right, so and I'll, I'm gonna I'll steer clear of the of the vendor note in there, but let's just suffice <laughs> to say nothing's perfect. No, <laughs> nothing's perfect. So I want to I want to take us to all right. Something hit the fan. Uh, your your everyday sim playbook, I presume, doesn't doesn't bode well <laughs> doesn't fare well in, no. in an aggressive well, situation so what, what do we what do we do there well let me be clear i would expect that it wouldn't okay and the reason why is i'm a small company and i've got most of the sims in my own lab and so when i'm prepping for a pen test my goal in a pen test is a bit different than an adversary's my goal is to get caught and then become quieter and quieter and quieter until you don't hear me anymore. And as part of that, I need to know what your default clipping level is. That's the actual term used for a detection level. And so I would be frankly disappointed if state-sponsored groups didn't have SIMs and were doing that, because if I can do that, they absolutely can do that. And so, and that's a very sobering thought. A lot of defenders don't realize that the attackers actually have your defensive stack. And so they get kind of surprised that I'm able to find out exactly, you know, how to, you know, do something. And they think it's like this crazy matrix move. And what they've missed is that there were literally hundreds and hundreds of hours in my lab trying to figure out how to how to like what that move is where you know I'm just throwing stuff on a wall seeing what sticks and then finally hey here we go um so no no a lot of it, like the real like if we're being for real the real adversaries are doing good trade craft and that's part of it they're putting the hours in and they know what it takes to evade and so as a result you have to start using your sim differently. You know, one of the biggest mistakes I see in a, in a sim or any logging situation is if a system is important enough to log, you really should be seeing that system uh, feeding you telemetry at a fairly frequent interval. For it to go offline, that's weird. That's really weird. You know, years ago, my wife and I were hiking in the woods once and it was a gorgeous day. It was awesome. And all of a sudden, the birds stopped chirping. And we freaked out. We looked around, and there was a freaking mountain lion that had stalked us. And it was the absence of those birds that keyed us into the mountain lion being there. Like, a lot of people are used to what are called positive detects. You know, like, they need the mountain lion to roar. Well, that probably would have been too late. I would have been kitty chow. <laughs> Thankfully, you're not. Thankfully yeah, spoiler not. alert, I made it. Uh, who, who knows how many times uh, I've been in that situation in the mountains and not known it. <laughs> but I've, I've been around coyotes making lots of noise, but uh, that's safe enough, I'd say. Um, but, but talking about the, the noise, um, mm -hmm. one of the things you, you actually say increase your logging and, yes. and perhaps even change some of your sim settings. I don't know. Did, you change the clipping mode so you see something differently do you, do you change the view of, of the data in a certain way what what do you do from a logging perspective and a, and a visual perspective there well so 
Uh, there's boy, this could be a whole series of podcasts. Um, <laughs> some of my favorite things to do are, um, uh, I like to do top talker analysis, like which machines are generating the most logs. So servers will generate a lot of logs. Um, desktops normally don't generate too much logs until something weird is going on. And you'll notice, like if you just do a, just a raw count of events, like when something sideways is happening on a desktop, that count like spikes, not by a little bit. Like it's, it, it, it's weird. A lot of attackers are, are, uh, because they know what your tool is looking for, they're, they're taking other liberties. And the best analogy I can give is if somebody's like sneaking across a floor, right? Like, you know how they hunch over and they do those real deliberate slow steps, they might not be making noise, but if you visually are just scanning the room and you see somebody doing that, you know, without a moment, like instinctually, you know, this person's up to no good. They're sneaking. And so what you have to do is just shift and use a different view. Top talkers, um, long tail analysis, like what's the one thing that happened? You know, machines are kind of boring. They, they do the same thing over and over again. But if you see like a single event, like, whoa, why did somebody plug in a USB stick on this server? You know, there th there's always something that you can investigate. You need to move beyond just the default alerts though, because they're, they, you know, they're, they're, they're good for most situations, but they're not going to give you the analysis that you really need. Yeah. The, the aggressive attacker knows those defaults. Already. They do. Yeah. Um, we're coming up close to the end. I'm going to jump to the, and there's, this, there's a ton of great stuff here. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to look at all these points and, and embrace them. Uh, CTI. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to broaden this not to, cause you talk about getting a feed, really use it if you have it already. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to broaden this to just intelligence and information sharing in any form. Okay. Um, to bring it, bring it back to the CTI if, if you want. Um, but leveraging the community, um, mm -hmm. and, le and the information that we have to better prepare thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of it. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can go about doing it. Probably the most formal approach is to be working at an organization that belongs to an ISAC, an information sharing and coordination. I think that's what ISAC stands for. Like different market verticals have their own ISAC. There's FS ISAC, which is for the financial services industry. There's aviation ISAC for, you know, airplane manufacturer to airports, everything, airplanes, right? So chances are, if you are working at an organization, there's an ISAC for your market vertical. What you should do is start participating in those ISACs because they will have different resource sharing groups where people will share, hey, here's the telemetry that I'm seeing, you know, just heads up. And the reason that they do that is because if, you know, say bank A is getting attacked by a particular attacker group, there's probably a good chance that bank one is also going to be attacked by the same group. And so it's in everybody's mutual interest to share that information. The other thing you can do is I've been seeing a lot of people joining discords and sharing stuff. I'm, I, 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 I'm normally all about the community, like how grassroots we are, but I actually like the more formal and um, process-driven stuff with ISACs for, for this particular use case. Maybe because it's validated? Well, it's not or just that it's validated. It's also that, you know, if I'm talking with just some friends on a Discord server, you know, maybe I've got friends at three banks, but if I'm in the FSI SAC, all of the financial services groups that are members can consume that if they so choose. So it's going to be a force multiplier for you. If you're really wanting to help everybody, take advantage of that. Yeah, take, take advantage of the formality. Perfect. Well, I'm going to take a moment to thank uh, Rock Lambros and, and Hacking LZ for uh, Confirming this is going to be amazing and to give me some some framing to uh, to have this chat with you, Nick. But most importantly, I want to thank you 
one for for putting that thread together. Uh, super insightful. I'm sure folks far more technical and engineering oriented than I am uh, will get even more out of it than I than I can. Uh, but super grateful you did that, and then thankful you took the time today to uh, talk through, through some of those points and to, uh, to engage with our folks here on ITSP Magazine. Thanks, man. Well, thank you. Have a great day. You as well. Stay safe, everybody, and uh, we'll catch you on the next Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. Archer empowers organizations to manage multiple dimensions of risk on one platform with on-premises and software-as-a-service offerings and quickly implement industry-standard processes and best practices for advanced risk management maturity, informed decision-making, and enhanced business performance. Learn more at archerirm.com. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Security Podcast. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.